Within Naruto exists hundreds, if not thousands of jutsus. And while the vast majority of those jutsus are only ever used once, even if a jutsu is only used the one time, it will still be given, like a jutsu used hundreds, if not thousands of times, like the Chidori or the Rasengan, a difficulty grading. And that makes sense, because pretty much everything in the Naruto universe is given a difficulty rating. Missions, missing ninja, and Jutsu. And all of these quantifiable entities fall on a scale of D rank to S rank. That is to say, if a mission is getting a cat out of a tree, it would be a D rank mission. But if the mission is sneaking into the Hidden Rain Village by yourself and gathering your information on the six paths of pain, then that would be an S rank mission. The same logic applies to Missing Ninja. If you were a perfectly cool Jonin who just decided to leave the village because you didn't pay a bar tab, then you'd probably be a D ranked Missing Nin. However, each individual member of the Akatsuki was an S rank Missing Nin. And while the Missing Nin category is a bit top heavy with S ranks, and you can say the same about Mission categorizations in Naruto because as the story progressed more and more s rank missions popped up but while you could say that those two quantifiable entities were top heavy in the s rank category you couldn't say that for the third category we've already talked about jutsu see like I've already touched on there was hundreds if not thousands of jutsu in the Naruto universe and every single one of those jutsus has a difficulty rating assigned to it and yet in the entirety of both Naruto and Boruto combined, there is only 25 s rank jutsu, which actually might come as a surprise to some of you, because I'm sure a lot of you didn't even believe there was that many. Because after all, s rank jutsus are reserved for only incredibly high-level jonin and kage-level threats. To assume that there was 25 of those jutsus floating around in this universe does seem a bit crazy, until you realize towards the end of Naruto Shippuden that anybody even remotely important is either a high-level jonin or a kage-level threat. On top of that, s rank jutsus are almost exclusively unique to a single unit. User. That is to say that S-Rank Jutsus aren't like the great fireball technique. There's no clan that uses them. Standouts from clans can use them, but usually the standout from that clan will have that S-Rank Jutsu as their signature ability. And thus, when we're talking about S-Rank Jutsus, we're talking about some of, if not the strongest Jutsus in the entirety of Naruto. And if they're not the strongest, they're at least the hardest to use. And today, we're going to be going over every single one of those Jutsus breaking down how it works, who uses it, and why it was given the classification of S-Rank. Because today, we're talking every S-Rank Jutsu in Naruto explained. But before we get to explaining anything, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And I'd also like to say thank you to the commenter who recommended this idea for a video. I... <laughs> I'm trying to find the comment and I simply cannot. But if you guys have any ideas for Naruto YouTube videos that I haven't covered yet and for some reason have just stumbled over, tell me in the comments below and maybe I'll get around to them eventually. But before we get into all that, today we got to talk about a brand new sponsor to the page, Groons. Groons wants to make hitting your nutritional goals easier. How many of you out there are taking multiple supplements a day? Or how many of you feel like you should be taking multiple supplements a day? Well, fortunately, because of Groons' comprehensive and convenient formula, which is neither a multivitamin, a greens gummy, or a probiotic, but instead all three of those things wrapped into one fantastic package, is not only going to give you all the nutrition you would get from taking those multiple supplements, but also give it to you at a fraction of the price. On top of that, they taste great. See, honestly, every single day, I look forward to my packet of Groons because they taste about as good as any gummy bear on the market. But they also help me with my gut health, my energy, and my cognition. In fact, if I don't take my daily Groons before I film a video, I feel like I'm filming in slow motion. And I absolutely adore that it's eight gummies per pack. One, it feels like a snack, and two, I feel like we preserve the flavor this way. On top of that, Groons are vegan, nut-free, dairy-free, and gluten-free. And they provide 20-plus vitamins per pack. Pack, while your standard multivitamin only offers seven to nine. And they're able to achieve that because over 60 whole food ingredients go into every pack of Groons. And they achieve this level of flavor with only three grams of added sugar. And they also offer a sugar-free option, all with no artificial colors or flavors. And if you're going on a road trip for a couple of days or you're gonna be out of town and away from your Groons pack, well, Fortunately, they're easy to travel with. On top of that, they're HSA and FSA eligible for reimbursement. So what are you waiting for? Get up to 45% off your Groons today using the link in my description. It's time nutrition started tasting good. At this point, I'm so deep in Naruto content, I don't remember exactly what I have covered and what I haven't covered. So Nick, how are we gonna do this? Are we gonna rank all 25 of these S-rank jutsus? I mean, uh... 
We could. But for those of you who have followed this page for any amount of time, you'll know that I usually try to keep the entries on a list type video less than 15 because this mouth just keeps talking and it won't stop doing it. And when I have more than 15 things to talk about, we start hitting the 40-ish minute mark. And that's when my editor who just had a baby and is upset with me about making all these longer videos starts to get really upset with me. And ranking adds time, like a lot of time. So today we're doing info dump so maybe down the line, we can do a ranking video because that's how you keep a Naruto page running for four plus years. So instead of ranking, we're gonna be doing this in the way that any sensical human would approach it alphabetically. Like for example, our first entry on the list, which is technically Boruto's Flying Thunder God Jutsu. Now I don't know why this is classified within official data books and the wiki has a different jutsu from Minato's Flying Thunder God Jutsu, but for some reason it is. But they're the same jutsu, so we're gonna treat them as one entry. So the first entry on our list is gonna be Flying Thunder God Technique, also known as Flying Raijin. Now Flying Raijin, as I like to call it, is a space-time ninjutsu created by Toby Rama. Now, this is essentially a reverse summoning jutsu created by Tobirama to allow him to get a leg up in battle against Izuna Uchiha. And this jutsu gave Tobirama access to a level of speed that even Izuna's MS wasn't able to keep up with. And Tobirama might be the third best user of this technique we've ever seen. We don't necessarily know how good Borto is with it quite yet. See, the reason that I refer to Flying Raijin as a reverse summoning technique is because it kind of is. See, Flying Raijin's general categorization is a space-time ninjutsu because it allows for the user to teleport from one location to another. However, the way the Flying Raijin does technically work is that the user has to place a marking either on something or someone that they teleport to. And the most terrifying part of Flying Raijin is the fact that these markings never go away. And this is actually why the data book refers to Flying Raijin as a Juin Jutsu. That is to say, a technique that guarantees the death of those it's applied to. Because, let's say hypothetically, either Boruto or Minato is able to mark me with a Flying Raijin mark. That means at any point in my life, barring the fact that I do not become a Ten-Tails Jinchuriki, because that seems to be the only way that one can remove a Flying Raijin mark, Boruto or Minato or Tobirama can pop up right beside me and stab me a whole bunch and then jump away. I am essentially a walking chakra GPS marker for the rest of my life, and there's nothing I can do about it. And thus, merely being touched by Minato or Tobirama or Boruto is essentially a death sentence. Though that may not be the actual case for Boruto because there is some evidence thus far in Two Blue Vortex that he can only jump to certain markers held by Kashin Koji's toads. On top of the fact that laying a flying Raijin mark is as easy as just touching somebody, there's seemingly no limit to how many somebody like Minato can place. But why is this Jutsu actively compared to a summoning technique. Well, because the person activating Flying Raijin enters a dimensional void that exists between two dimensions, a space where nothing exists. Upon entering this dimensional void, they travel to whatever mark they're currently jumping to. And because there is nothing in this dimension, no oxygen, no matter, no antimatter, no nothing, their travel to this other marker is instantaneous, regardless of how far away the marker is. And we now know from Boruto, that this even applies to interdimensional travel. But the user of Flying Raijin isn't only able to transport themselves. Anything that they're holding, contacting, or that is linked with their chakra also jumps with them. On top of that, Minato has also shown us through the usage of Flying Raijin that he's able to make essentially portals with his derived technique, Flying Thunder God, Guiding Thunder. And that's a technique that Minato is able to use that essentially creates a barrier of Flying Raijin that sends anything that comes into contact with this barrier to another marked location which is how Minato was able to redirect a tailed beast bomb from Kurama on the night of Naruto's birth. And this jutsu is legit. There's a reason it's one of the most famous jutsus in all of Naruto. Through the usage of just this jutsu and this jutsu alone, both Tobirama and Minato were known as the fastest ninjas alive during their respective times alive. As through the usage of Flying Raijin and just Minato's reaction time, Minato was able to keep up with people like A, the fourth Raikage, while using his lightning cloak. And Minato is so incredibly fast with the Flying Raijin that he was able to teleport a large large portion of the Shinobi Alliance outside of the barrier that held the Ten Tails when it was clear the Ten Tails was about to try and destroy said barrier with a tailed beast ball. But why is this jutsu so hard? Well, one, you're basically summoning yourself across a dimensional void every single time that you use it, which requires an insane amount of chakra. But if you also remember anything about Naruto trying to summon Gamabuta in the early parts of Naruto, you'll know that continually pulling off a summoning jutsu the correct way is very difficult. This is why people even as talented as Hiruzen 
weren't able to learn the flying Raijin. And why Minato's Hokage escort team, which was comprised of Genma and Raido, and Iwashi in the anime, had to derive something known as the Flying Thunder Formation Technique, where the three of them would essentially work together to use the Flying Raijin Technique so they could keep up with Minato. But keeping up with Minato isn't even exactly what this jutsu was created to do, as essentially this jutsu was created so that the Hokage Guard Platoon could teleport to the side of the Hokage wherever they were. And still, it takes three people to use. And just like that, we're 100 clips in and I've done one. Up next, we have Continuous Tailed Beast Balls. Now, fortunately, there's a whole lot less information on Continuous Tailed Beast Balls than there is on Flying Raijin, because Continuous Tailed Beast Balls is kind of exactly what it sounds like. It's when either a tailed beast or a transformed Jinchuriki fires a volley of tailed beast balls. But for those of you who remember how tailed beast balls are made, you might say firing those continuously seems kind of impossible, because in order to fire a tailed beast ball in the first place, you have to compress the perfect ratio of positive and negative chakra into a dense little purple ball. And you're right. Technically, firing a compressed tailed beast ball in any sort of volley would be impossible. This is why in order to use this jutsu, you have to fire uncompressed tailed beast balls, which are less powerful, but there's more of them, so it's kind of like key blasts in Dragon Ball. Now, obviously, in order to use continuous tailed beast balls, you have to either be a transformed Jinchuriki or just a tailed beast, and so the margin for pulling something like this off is already incredibly high, which is why it's an s rank jutsu. Thus far, the only people we've seen with the ability to do this are Giyuki and Karama, aka Killer B and Naruto. But enough about continuous tail beast balls, let's get on to our next entry on the list, Creation Rebirth. Now you want to know the craziest thing about Creation Rebirth, or what's lovingly known by the community as the strength of a hundred seal, or I guess what's more commonly known as the unlocking of the Byakuya seal by either Tsunade or Sakura, is that this feat of either of them tapping into the strength of a hundred seal or something like that, is one of the most misunderstood abilities in all of Naruto. See, here's the thing. That thing that Sakura and Tsunade do when they unlock the diamond on their forehead and the marks go all across their body and now they're super strong and they heal super quickly is four separate S-tier jutsus. What do you mean, Nick? I'm gonna break it down for you. I say right foot creep, oh, oh. And now I'm gonna explain it. First step in the opening of the Strength of 100 Seal is simply having the Strength of 100 Seal, which is an S-class jutsu. See, the Strength of 100 Seal is a jutsu that's apparently been around since Hagoromo's era, and it requires some of the most precise and delicate chakra control out of any jutsu in the entirety of the Naruto universe. But why? Well, the Strength of 100 Seal works by the user, slowly storing a section of their chakra in a part of their body, usually the forehead, over a long amount of time, which is usually years, but by the time the war comes around is literally minutes. In the case of Sakura, prior to the Third Great Shinobi World War and her first ever activation of the Strength of 100 Seal, she had been storing a small amount of her chakra every single day on her forehead, like Tsunade. And this is why the Jutsu is so incredibly difficult, because in order to take a small section of your chakra every single day and continually store it in one part of your body requires a level of chakra control that almost everybody on earth doesn't have. And thus only highly trained medical ninjutsu users or highly trained genjutsu users would ever be able to pull it off. But the benefits of the strength of a hundred seal don't just start when it's activated. See, once a seal is formed, just the rhombus on the forehead, the level of mastery of chakra control from the person who's been able to manifest that rhombus is so high that any jutsu they use has zero wasted energy behind it. That is to say that if 10 people were to use a great fireball technique, all 10 of those people would use a differing amount of chakra and that still applies if the great fireball technique is the exact same size and heat from all 10 of those people because all 10 of those people have differing chakra control in the case of somebody who's been able to manifest the rhombus on their forehead the strength of a hundred seal they would be using the exact amount of chakra necessary to pull off that jutsu at that heat and size complete 100% efficiency. On top of that, outside of the strength and efficiency provided by this marking, only those blessed with this marking have the ability to summon and use the abilities of Lady Katsuyo. That is to say that the amount of healing ability and power of Lady Katsuyo as a summon is directly proportional to how much chakra the summoner has in their strength of a hundred seal. And now the next step in the usage of the strength of a hundred seal that also happens to be an S rank jutsu is yin seal 
release. Now, this is kind of exactly what it sounds like. It is the activation of the strength of a hundred seal. And this is the moment when that diamond opens up and begins to draw markings all across either Tsunade or Sakura's bodies. And it's at this point that any user of the strength of a hundred seal now has access to all of the chakra they've been accumulating, presumably for years. Now, this chakra doesn't necessarily have to be used by the person who's released their yin seal, as the chakra can be given to somebody else. And when that chakra is given to somebody else, you'll see the markings of of the yin seal begin to encroach over onto their body. But usually the activation of this seal is because the person who's activating it wants to use incredibly chakra depleting techniques like creation rebirth, which is a technique that was invented by Tsunade and is also an S rank jutsu. Now this jutsu is done by forcing a large amount of chakra to flow through the body to stimulate cell growth. Well, not cell growth, but cell division. And the division of cells is forcibly stimulated to the point that while creation rebirth birth is activated, the user cannot die because any organ or body part lost will be immediately regenerated. Now, we don't necessarily know what would happen if the user of creation rebirth was decapitated because we've never seen it, but it has been referred to as the pinnacle of medical ninjutsu and the ultimate regeneration technique. It does, however, it does operate as a double-edged sword as the cells in the body are not healed, but instead stimulated into division. And since cells can only go through mitosis a certain amount of times, this does technically shorten the lifespan of the person using creation rebirth but Tsunade is pushing 80 and still around so apparently it's not all that bad but Nick what happens if you master creation rebirth great question man or woman if you're the 5.5 percent of my followers that are women five percent <laughs> nice. But back to what happens if you're one of the rare people who's mastered creation rebirth. Because if you've mastered creation rebirth, you get ninja art creation rebirth strength of 100 technique, which is also an S rank jutsu, which means prior to using this S rank jutsu, you have to master three other S rank jutsus. But how is ninja art creation rebirth strength of 100 technique different from creation rebirth? Well, because it operates more similarly to how Hashirama's healing factor worked than creation rebirth. That is to say that it essentially works in the same way as creation rebirth however there's no hand seals required to heal the body it has a continuous automatic effect that will heal any damage incurred to the person activating said technique so long as the user has chakra left with no conscious input whatsoever the body will heal itself on top of the healing factor however the user also gets the benefits of the strength of a hundred seals which means they're able to massively increase their strength and speed which is how Tsunade was able to break Madara Susano ribcage with a kick and thus when somebody's talking about the strength of 100 seal, they're actually talking about four separate S rank jutsu, which makes the usage of the strength of 100 seal by Sakura and Tsunade all the more impressive. But enough about jutsus that make sure you stay alive. What about jutsus that make sure you and somebody else absolutely die? Because next up on the list, we have the dead demon consuming seal, also known as the Reaper Death Seal. Now, the Reaper Death Seal is a sealing technique created by the Uzumaki clan to call upon the power of the Shinigami, the god of death. And thus, in a way, this technique's actually less of a sealing technique and more of a summoning technique. However, in exchange for summoning the Shinigami, you have to give your soul, which is a fair enough deal if you're trying to seal somebody with incredible power. See, the Reaper Death Seal is one of the most interesting and therefore one of the most talked about jutsus in all of Naruto. And that's because it fundamentally works in a genuinely sick way. See, after the hand seals for the Reaper Death Seal are completed, a Shinigami that only the user of the Reaper Death Seal can see appears behind them and removes, at least partially, their soul from out of of their back. It's at this point that the soul of the user is held by the Shinigami's hair. And a couple of moments after the Shinigami has taken a hold of the summoner's soul, Shinigami pulls out prayer beads and begins to chant, at which point curse marks begin to descend down its arm. And once the curse marks have fully descended down its arm, it thrusts said arm into the back and through the stomach of the summoner. Now, the range of this jutsu is somewhat contentious. See, because we've only technically seen this jutsu used twice, when Hiruzen used it and when Minato used it. Now, here is in focus on the fact that he would have to get close to Orochimaru in order for the Shinigami to reach their soul. However, when Minato uses the Reaper Death Seal against Kurama, he does so from a fairly large distance away. And thus, it's kind of agreed upon that the amount of chakra you have access to comes into play when calculating the range, as the primary difference between Minato 
Kano's activation and Hiruzen's activation is a Mount of Chakra and how that played in to the result. And after the Shinigami has gotten a hold of the target soul, a tug of war starts. See, Reaper Death Seal works like a chakra tug of war. If you have more chakra than the person whose soul you're trying to pull out of their body, then you can take their entire soul into the Shinigami stomach. However, if you have less chakra than them, then you can only pull in part of their soul to the Shinigami stomach. And fortunately, both you and the person who's having their soul pulled out of them will have a fair amount of time to focus on this tug of war, because the second that your target soul is grabbed, they become immobilized, and any jutsu that they were using dissipates. And it's also at this point that they're able to see the Shinigami, so they gotta lock it. Now, with the sounds powerful, it's not a fun way to go, because the summoner's soul and the target's soul will be pulled into the Shinigami stomach, where they'll be forced to fight for eternity. You don't get to, like all other dead ninjas, to go to the Pure Lands. But since we're talking about Orochimaru, this definitely isn't the only entry that the person dedicated to trying to figure out how to use every jutsu on Earth is going to have. In fact, Orochimaru is on this list more commonly than literally anybody else. And that trend starts right here with our next entry on the list, the Eight Branches Technique. Now, this is Orochimaru's greatest and strongest snake-related technique. Now, this jutsu allows for Orochimaru to transform into an eight-headed, eight-tailed snake. That's bigger than the biggest snake on Earth, Monda. And because this is Naruto, and this tends to be the way the transformations work in Naruto, while in this giant eight-tailed, eight-headed form, Rochimaru is able to slither out the mouth of one of those eight heads and attack with his blade of Kusanagi. Now, while we don't technically get to see much of this technique because it's pretty much the worst thing Rochimaru could have used in a battle against the blade of Totsuka and Itachi, it's safe to assume that the application of this technique very easily makes Rochimaru as powerful as any tailed beast. And thus, the manifestation of this technique not only requires channeling the the power of the Great White Snake Sage, but also just an insane amount of chakra, which is why it's an s rank jutsu. But speaking of the battle against Itachi, the next entry we have on this list is Kirin. And this is actually the only time that Sasuke is on this list, which feels wild to me. But if any of Sasuke's techniques were to be s rank, it would be Kirin, because Kirin is by far and away the most difficult. See, Sasuke's Kirin is not only so powerful it was almost able to kill Itachi, who was manifesting his Susano at the time, but is also one of the most technically impressive jutsus in all of Naruto. And see, Sasuke's Kirin operates differently from all other lightning release in Naruto, because Sasuke's Kirin doesn't turn his chakra into lightning, but instead pulls lightning from the sky and controls it. Now, this does technically make the usage of Kirin very situational, as in order for Sasuke to use it, there technically has to be thunderclouds overhead. What it lacks in convenience, it makes up for in strength and speed. See, because it is physical lightning that Sasuke is attacking with, Zetsu tells us that the attack lands in one one thousandth of a second, which makes sense. Kirin travels at the speed of lightning because it is lightning. Now, the speed of lightning, mind you, is somewhere in the region of Mach 300, 364 to be exact, which means that through the application of Kirin, Sasuke is essentially able to make a dragon made out of real, actual lightning that strikes whatever target he wants, but it can only be used once. Now, the shape transformation applied to the lightning alone would classify this jutsu as an s rank jutsu, but also the fact that Sasuke has to be able to pull lightning and direct lightning to the ground in less than 1 1,000 thousandth of a second, because mind you, Sasuke is guiding that incredibly fast lightning, he also pretty easily cements home the idea that this is an s rank jutsu. Tie that into the fact that Sasuke often has to make his own thunderstorms by firing high-level fire release into the sky to make thunderclouds, and yeah, it's not easy to use, but it does look pretty cool, even if you only get one attack per thunderstorm. Speaking of thunderstorms though, God, the segues are banging this episode. Next up on this list, we have Lightning Cutter, also known as Raikiri. And a lot of you are probably scratching your head right now thinking Chidori's not an s rank jutsu, and you're right, it's not. But Raikiri is. So why is Raikiri an s rank jutsu when Chidori isn't? Well, the answer is ironically in the name. Raikiri or Lightning Cutter refers to the fact that Kakashi was able to cut lightning in half with his Raikiri. Well, I guess at the time, it was the Chidori and the act of cutting lightning in half made it the Raikiri. Now, there's never necessarily been any clear indicator that the Raikiri and Chidori are even fundamentally different outside of the fact that one of them is an A-ranked Jutsu and the other is an S-ranked Jutsu. Outside of that, literally everything is exactly the same. Now, the reason that the Raikiri and the Chidori are so highly ranked is because they require a Sharingan to use. Because of the application of Electrified Chakra to the hand and the linear action of the Chidori slash Raikiri attack, those who are using this attack tend to get tunnel vision. Tunnel vision, which is counteracted through the usage of the Sharingan. Now, ironically, the fact that the Raikiri is an S-ranked jutsu doesn't 
actually mean that all derived jutsus of the Raikiri are s rank jutsus. For example, Lightning Release, Lightning Beast Tracking Fang, the ability that allows Kakashi to turn his Raikiri into a giant tiger that he used to attack the Deva Path, is a C rank jutsu, which doesn't necessarily make sense to me when you consider the fact that you need to be able to use Raikiri, the s rank jutsu, to use the Tracking Fang. And while I said every jutsu in the entirety of Naruto is given a ranking, yeah, I might have fibbed a little bit. Some jutsu that are well and truly only ever used once sometimes don't get a ranking. Like the Kamui Lightning Cutter, which is the six packs application of Kakashi's Raikiri that allows him to teleport anybody that he hits with his Raikiri into the Kamui dimension, and Lightning Transmission, which is a jutsu that Kakashi uses in conjunction with a Shadow Clone, where he attaches his Raikiri to his Shadow Clone's Raikiri to make a clothesline of electricity. Kind of like the opening of Ghost Ship. That is a nuanced reference. I'd be surprised if a hundred of you get that. But yeah, for the sheer fact that Kakashi had to learn the Rasengan, try to apply lightning release to that Rasengan, collapse that Rasengan, create the Chidori, and then use that Chidori to cut lightning in half, the Raikiri is going to get an S rank. I mean, the Rasengan by itself is an A rank jutsu, so applying lightning release to it, collapsing it, and then using that jutsu to cut lightning in half is going to tick it up just a little bit. But enough about Kakashi, it's been way too long since we talked about Orochimaru, who's back on this list for the third time already. Because coming up next, we have Living Corpse Reincarnation, a technique developed by Orochimaru that allows for them to transfer their soul into different bodies, also referred to as the Eternal Youth and Immortality Technique. See, the real power of this technique is that it technically immortalizes the user's brain, which allows for the user to transfer said immortal brain into stronger host bodies before the host body they're currently in rots. Now, the time period for a host body rotting is somewhat hazy, but it's usually in the ballpark of three years, which is ironically how often Orochimaru is able to use this technique. Kind of perfect. Now, the reason that I say the timeline for a host body rotting is kind of hazy when it seems to be pretty solidly every three years Orochimaru has to switch is because Orochimaru is constantly talking about the idea of a perfect host. And these perfect hosts are supposedly somebody that Orochimaru would be able to live inside of for the entirety of their full lifetime. Because the problem with the average bodies that Orochimaru switches into is that after three years, the host body begins to weaken and reject them. And thus, genuinely, the toughest aspect of using this jutsu is the continual control required over the host body you're switching into, as well, sometimes the host is willing. Even if the host is willing, the body will eventually reject you. On top of that, in order to use this jutsu in the first place, Orochimaru has to tap into their original form, the Great White Snake. Orochimaru then has to swallow the new prospective host, take them into some kind of mental, grossed intestine land and dominate their will in order to subject them into being a host. So for the fact that it's a mental tug of war and it requires you to turn into a giant white snake that consumes somebody, yeah, it's going to pretty easily be an S tier rank difficulty jutsu. But if we're talking about jutsus with high barrier of entries to use, well then I don't think there's a barrier of entry higher than our next entry, which is Night Guy. Yeah, Night Guy is an s rank jutsu. Seems kind of intuitive, right? What do you mean steaming your own inside so your blood leaks out of your pores and makes a dragon that's so massive and fast that it bends space-time is an s rank jutsu? Who would have guessed? Well, you probably should have guessed because that's exactly why Night Guy is an s rank jutsu. See, Night Guy is probably the highest level taijutsu move in existence and it can only be performed after opening all eight gates. But why can it only be used after opening all eight gates? Great question. Well, because the first step of Night Guy is to yell a mass, which releases a massive amount of blood red steam from your body. Now, it's not just blood red steam, it's red blood steam, because the reason the steam is red in the first place and releasing from your body is because the inside of your body is so hot, it's literally boiling your blood. Then yell out flow, which takes this giant massive red dragon and you at an incredible pace at whatever target you're trying to destroy. And you and this dragon fly at speeds so incredibly fast that you distort the space in front of you, which makes the kick impossible to dodge or block. And this kick was so incredibly powerful that Madara, as the Tentails Shinchuriki, feared for his life. But because all actions have an equal and opposite reaction, the power of this kick is so incredibly brutal on Mike Guy's body that he shattered every bone in his leg. And he's still wearing the cast today. But speaking of jutsus that killed the user, next up on the list, we have One's Own Life Reincarnation. Now, this is a jutsu that was created by the Hidden Sands Puppet Brigade, but most notably Granny Chio. Now, one of the biggest problems in the Hidden Sand, at least from the Hidden Sands perspective, is the fact that their population isn't big enough to supplement what they would consider a sufficient army, which is why they began to use puppets, because puppet users were able to be five to six to a hundred members on the battlefield. However, that wasn't far enough. 
apparently, because the Hidden Sands Puppet Brigade took it one step further and tried to find a way to bring puppets to life. Now, unfortunately, they couldn't necessarily find a way to do this until one's own life reincarnation came around. Now, the shoots can be used on both the living and the dead, and is essentially just a chakra handoff. And thus, when this technique is used on the living, it heals them and gives them chakra and leaves the user of the technique exhausted. But when it's used on the dead, it brings them back to life at the cost of the user's life. And thus, because only one person in the entirety of the puppet brigade was able to figure out how to use this jutsu, and that was Granite Shio, who died with the knowledge of how to use this jutsu and the fact that it can bring the long dead back to life pretty much solidifies the fact that this is very easily and very fittingly an s rank jutsu but since we're talking about puppets man i cannot believe how good the segues are this episode coming up next we have the red secret technique performance of 100 puppets see this technique is specific to sorcery and opens with sorcery removing a scroll from his back and opening a compartment on his chest that releases 100 strings that connect to the 100 puppets that come from the scroll he opened off his back. Now, the reason this jutsu is S-ranked is because usually high-level puppeteers are only able to control 10 puppets at a time, one for each finger. However, Saucery doesn't control these 100-plus puppets with his fingers. See, the strings that are released from Saucery's chest are directly connected to his core, and thus Saucery is able to directly input commands to all 100-plus of these puppets in real time. Now, the reason that this is impressive is because usually there's a lag between the puppeteer and the puppet. That's because the will of the puppeteer has to be conveyed through the movements and chakra flow through the fingers to the puppet before the puppet can move on said will. But because these puppet strings are directly connected to Saucery's core, there's no time lag between Saucery's commands and the puppet's movements. And this technique is so incredibly powerful that Saucery was able to take down the entirety of the land of this with this technique alone. I still will never forgive the anime showrunners for making two places called the land of this and the land of that and having them be warring countries. My God. What are we doing? See, Sasori's true strength with his technique comes from his sheer ability to overwhelm anyone he's battling against. See, because while his puppets lack teamwork, they do have numbers. And on top of that, all of his puppets wield weapons coated with a poison that kills you after three days of a painful paralysis. On top of this, if you are able to destroy some of Saucery's puppets, it just allows for him to give more attention to the other puppets. And thus, the less puppets Saucery has, the stronger those puppets get. So for the sheer fact that you have to make yourself a puppet, attach 100 strings to what's left of the core of you in that puppet, and then use those 100 strings to direct the actions of 100 plus puppets, yeah, it's gonna be an s rank jutsu. But speaking of chorus, next up on our list, we have Reverse Force Symbol Ceiling. Nick, what's Reverse Force Symbol Ceiling? Great question. Probably the least known out of all of the s ranked jutsus on this list. This is the jutsu that Donzo used in the moment of his death. See, the Reverse Force Symbol Ceilings is a powerful Fuin jutsu that activates upon the user's death. So long as you've placed this seal on your chest prior to your death, when your death does eventually come around, this seal will activate. And as you die, four symbols will appear on your chest and you will create a giant black sphere around you that pulls in anything to your corpse and anything caught in that black sphere will be sealed within your corpse forever. That is to say that this is essentially like martyrdom in COD, except instead of a grenade, you get sealed inside of the body of an old dead man. So worse now out of all of the s rank jutsu entries on this list this one feels the least like an s rank to me but i guess because it's a fuin jutsu that requires you to die and it's able to seal anything and anybody into your corpse I, I, that's kind of difficult i don't know i just don't see it but since we're talking about death and sealing let's talk about our next entry on this list sealing technique phantom dragons nine consuming seals my god what a name. In much simpler terms, this is the ceiling jutsu used by the ghetto statue in the Akatsuki to pull tailed beasts out of Jin Cherokee. Now, in the complete opposite sense, if ever there was a technique that made sense being an S rank, this would be the one. See, breaking a Jin Cherokee seal is next to impossible. That's why Obito attacks when Kushina is giving birth. On top of that, it would take nine members of the Akatsuki three full days to extract a tailed beast from a Jin Cherokee. That's nine of the strongest people in the universe working collectively collaboratively for three whole days with the assistance of the ghetto statue. And in order to use this technique, technically 10 members of the Akatsuki were supposed to be there to do it, but nine members of the Akatsuki would go to the ghetto statue that Nagato had summoned uh, and stand on the finger of the ghetto statue that corresponds to the finger they wear their Akatsuki ring on. Yes, that's why every member of the Akatsuki wears their ring on a different finger. Every member of the Akatsuki then has to concentrate, which leads to the kanji on their ring manifesting above them, at which point nine should be 10. Orochimaru 
stole the ring after leaving the Akatsuki. Dragons pour out of the ghetto statue's mouth and dive into the Jinchuriki whose tailed beast they're trying to extract. And even the case that a tailed beast is being assimilated into the ghetto statue without the complication of being inside of a Jinchuriki, the process still takes three days. So yeah, the jutsu there requires nine, should technically be 10, S-ranked ninjas to come together to work collaboratively for three days to accomplish a goal is very easily an S-ranked jutsu. What do you do if you have to pee? But speaking of jutsus that should absolutely be talked about in the same category as that monstrosity, next up we have spirit transformation technique. And once again, you ask, Nick, what is that? Oh, you know, it's, it's Dan's signature technique, the one that allows him to become Danny Phantom. That's why they called him Dan, because of, Danny Fan, he's a ghost. Well, kind of. He's more like a glorified Yamanaka. See, this technique allows for Dan's soul to leave his body. And also, kind of like a Yamanaka, but way more powerful, Dan has the ability to fly into other people's bodies, collapse their will, and kill them. Yeah, Dan's S rank ability is fatal bad vibes. But crushing somebody's spirit, forcing them to die, isn't all that Dan can do. He can also forcibly control their actions, like a Yamanaka. On top of that, this technique can also be used to transfer information or chakra to the those being taken over. And the wildest part about this technique is that if Dan is thinking about somebody, he can send his soul to them, regardless of where they are. Even if Dan doesn't know where they are, his soul will reach that destination. So if Dan's like, oh, I want to take over Madara's body, but I don't know where Madara is, he can just send his soul out and it will find Madara. And the wildest part about all of this is that there's really no way to stop him because he's a ghost in this form and has no physical body. Therefore, enemy attacks can't hurt him. So if he wants to take over your body, it's just his. Which is A, why Kabuto brought him back to life, and B, why Dan told everybody when he was alive this technique killed a lot of people. He then told everybody that the literal only way to stop him from being the worst poltergeist we'd ever seen was to seal the body and the soul in a barrier of sorts. My god, man. How did he die? Honestly, if I'm the Yamanaka, I'm killing him, and Tsunade being blonde is possibly evidence to that theory. So yeah, not only is this jutsu incredibly powerful, but it also requires probably an insane amount of chakra control, because fundamentally, Dan crushing somebody's spirit does operate like a genjutsu of sorts, where Dan has to have a more precise chakra control than the person he's taking over so that he can crush their spirit by controlling their chakra. But we should talk about the reason that Dan was even back in the fourth grade Shinobi World War in the first place, because our next entry on the list is Edo Tensei or summoning impure world reincarnation. Now, this is the second entry on this list created by Tobirama. Good job, best Okage. And this is a jutsu that binds the soul of a deceased person to a living vessel. Something that people often forget is that in order to use Edo Tensai, you need a living person, not a corpse. And by gaining a DNA sample of the person you're trying to reincarnate, so long as that person's soul is within the Pure Lands, you are able to reach into the Pure Lands, grab that person's soul, and tie their soul to this living vessel. And the person you bring back to life will be exactly Exactly as they were in the moment of their death, essentially, without any of the injuries. They'll just be like as old as they were when they died. But if the person whose soul you're trying to reincarnate is in something like the Shinigami stomach or the land of drunken dreams, you won't be able to reincarnate them. And thus, in essence, this is a summoning technique with a sacrifice for somebody in the Pure Lands. After the person from the Pure Lands is reincarnated, assuming they're not more powerful than you are, you'll have control over their will. And there's really two ways you can go about this. And those two ways are either the way that Orochimaru goes about it or the way that Kabuto goes about it. See, Kabuto is a quantity over quality person, while Orochimaru is a quality over quantity person. Sikabuto resurrects people and allows them to have free will over their thoughts, but not their actions. Sikabuto gives a prime directive to every single person that he reincarnates, and the person that he reincarnates has to follow that prime directive. Kabuto does this because he believes that that person with free will over their own abilities and thoughts will be much better and more suited for accomplishing this goal than if Kabuto was individually controlling each person, because nobody knows the abilities of the person being reincarnated better than the person being reincarnated. Now, Rochimaru is the exact opposite. Orochimaru opts for more control, individually controlling the actions, movements, and motivations of every single person they bring back, which does offer Orochimaru more control and doesn't put Orochimaru in situations like Gengetsu Hozuki telling the 4th Division how to defeat him, but also leads to Orochimaru being able to control less Edo Tensai people. Now, obviously, when Orochimaru finally gets around to summoning all four of the previous Hokage to the 4th Great Shinobi World's War, they opt out of this, giving the four of them complete and total free will, which is only something that an Edo Tensai person is able to accomplish 
accomplish if they either know the hand signs for Edo Tensai or use some high-level genjutsu on themselves like Koto Amatsukame. And while there is some weaknesses in the earliest iterations of Edo Tensai, like the fact that Tobirama himself realized that the people he brought back weren't nearly as strong as they were when they were alive, and he couldn't bring that many people back, both Orochimaru and Kabuto both improved on these flaws until eventually, with Kabuto, neither of those flaws existed, as Kabuto was able to bring Madara back much stronger than he was when he was alive. Which is terrifying when you consider the fact that Edo Tensei gives those who are reincarnated through this medium infinitely refilling chakra, not infinite chakra, and infinite regeneration, which means if their arm is cut off, it will regenerate, assuming it's not slashed with a Keke Mora like the expanse of True Seeker orbs, because the True Seeker orbs attack the soul and not the body, which is why Minato never gets his arms back. Tie that into the fact that Edo Tensei sacrifices are also able to turn their bodies into explosive seals, and the infinite regeneration just infinitely generates more explosive seals, leading to a continuous and massive explosion. And while I could do an entire video on Edo Tensai, I've already done it, so we're gonna stop it there. But it is genuinely considered the strongest jutsu in all of Naruto for a reason. You can make an army of the strongest ninja of all time, all under your control for the low, low cost of a couple of living sacrifices and some blood smears. And controlling them doesn't require a continual input of chakra, and your death doesn't release them. It is a jutsu that never should have been created, and it is inarguably the worst thing that Tobirama ever did. Because it is also the only bad thing he ever did. But speaking of bad things, our next entry on the list is it's kind of dumb because our next entry on the list is the super mini tailed beast ball which is something that we saw naruto use in kcm1 now this technique has naruto creating a tailed beast ball in his hand with the appropriate amount of negative and positive chakra he then compresses that tailed beast ball down to smaller than a rasengan and then he hits somebody with it like it's a rasengan but at least upon contact it explodes like a Rasengan. It's a Rasengan, but smaller and more powerful. But oh, but don't think you're done with Tailed Beast Balls yet, because next up on our list is literally just the Tailed Beast Ball, which is a technique performed by Transformed Jinchuriki and Tailed Beasts that requires the compiling and balancing of positive and negative chakra at an 8 to 2 ratio and condensing it down into a super condensed chakra ball that's ridiculously heavy and then fired at an opponent that leads to a massive nuke-like explosion. Now, there's a lot of different variations of the Tailed Beast Ball. While Tailed Beast 1 through 9 fire out balls, the Ten Tails fires out a cone. It's also a possibility to consume the Tailed Beast Ball and fire out a beam. On top of that, there's no limit to how much chakra can be added to a Tailed Beast Ball. So long as the ratio of 8 to 2 chakra is withheld, it can be the size of the earth. On top of that, because Tailed Beast Balls don't technically use the chakra of the user, users of the Tailed Beast Ball can make Tailed Beast Balls multiple times larger than themselves that have more chakra than even they hold. And if that's not enough for you, Tailed Beast Balls can also be combined with each other to make an ultra big Tailed Beast Ball. Well then, Nick, why isn't everybody charging up Tailed Beast Balls the size of Earth? Well, one, there probably isn't that much negative and positive chakra floating around, and two, because they're incredibly heavy. Naruto and KCM1 struggled to hold the Tailed Beast Ball the size of his palm. However, just because they're incredibly heavy does not mean they're not incredibly fast. As a Tailed Beast Ball fired by the Ten Tails traveled several miles to the Shinobi Alliance HQ in a matter of seconds. And while there doesn't appear to be a standard rate of devastation for a Tailed Beast Ball, because mind you, they can all be different sizes, with differing amount of chakra. A standard Tailed Beast Ball can evaporate a mountain. Now, this isn't necessarily the standard for the newest iteration of Tailed Beast Balls that we've seen, most notably the one that Jura is using, generating it in front of his eye, as this appears to be more akin to a laser than a bomb, but this just more speaks to the versatility of this move. So for the sheer fact that only Transformed Jinchuriki and Tailed Beasts are able to use this move, and the fact that it can evaporate mountains in a second, yeah, it's gonna be S rank. And if you thought you were done with Tailed Beast Balls, <laughs> you're not, because next up on our list is the Tailed Beast Ball Ross and Shuriken, which is a Ross and Shuriken but a tailed beast ball. Now you might assume because a tailed beast Ross and Shuriken is smaller than your average tailed beast ball that it's weaker. Not the case. See Naruto by adding wind nature and shape transformation to a tailed beast ball actually makes it stronger. And thus the explosions of a tailed beast Ross and Shuriken actually dwarf the explosions of a regular tailed beast ball, which is why Naruto is able to destroy multiple Chibaku Tensei satellites with just one Ross and Shuriken tailed beast ball. So for the sheer fact that Naruto is not only holding a tailed beast ball, but also throwing it and applying shape transformation to it, if anything should be a double S rank, it's probably that. But if you thought we were done with tailed beast balls, 
we are actually. Because next up, we have the water prison shark dance technique. Now, this is a jutsu used by Kisame, specifically after he uses water release great exploding water colliding wave, which is a jutsu that allows Kisame to make any battlefield essentially an ocean. Now, after making that battlefield an ocean, Kisame uses water prison shark dance technique to make that ocean into a gigantic prison. Now, the way that this technique works is that it makes a giant bubble of water around Kisame, and Kisame operates as the center of this bubble at all times, which means if Kisame goes somewhere, the bubble rolls with him, which means basically so long as Kisame follows his pursuit of the people that are trapped in this gigantic prison with him, they'll never be able to escape this giant water bubble. Tie this into the fact that Kisame has the ability to fuse with Samihata to just become a shark. It means that basically nobody has a chance to escape from this water bubble because nobody can swim faster than he can. And thus in a one-on-one -on -one battle against anybody who's not either an incredible water release user or also a shark, Kisame will 90 nine times out of a hundred drown his opponent. However, where this technique falters a little bit is if there's more than one person in this gigantic prison, if they swim in different directions, Kisame has to follow one of them, which means the other one might get away. But one of the most deadly juices in all of Naruto when it comes down to a 1v1, so yes, it gets the S rank. But enough about Kisame, we haven't talked nearly enough about puppets yet, because coming up in our second to last spot, we have the white secret technique, the Chikamatsu collection of 10 puppets. Now, this is an ninjutsu created by the creator of weaponized puppets, Monzai on Chikamatsu. So you remember earlier when I said that the highest level of puppeteer is able to control 10 puppets at once, one for each finger? Well, this ninjutsu is built around that idea. However, these puppets are special. They're unique. They were made by the guy who created puppets. And thus it stated that every single one of the puppets in the Monzai Mon Chikamatsu collection has the power of a thousand puppets put together. Tie that into the fact that these puppets were created to work collaboratively with each other and the ridiculous power of these individual puppets and the teamwork they're able to pull off because they were built to work with each other makes these 10 puppets and therefore the puppeteer using these 10 puppets the deadliest puppeteer on earth. Even though Sasori states that these puppets had once been said to take down an entire castle before when his 100 puppet technique had been said to take down an entire country, but whatever. Now I could go over every single one of these puppets, what their abilities were and how they were able to work together offensively and defensively in a collaborative fashion, but I've already done that in my Granite Shield breakdown video, I think. And if I haven't, Boy, oh boy, did I just find a fantastic new video. But just in case I haven't, I'll give you a little bit of information on how they're able to collaborate and why that makes them so powerful. See, their most noted collaboration is the three jewel suction crushing technique, which has puppets six, seven, and eight working together to make a triangle of sorts and opening mechanisms on their body marked with the signs Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. It's at this point that a tornado opens up between this triangular formation that sucks in everything in front of it with a crushing force that eviscerates anything with the misfortune of being pulled in to the point where it's spit out the back in dust pieces. And it's collaborative techniques like these and Sakura that allow for Granny Chio to win in battle against the 100 puppets of Saucer. And that's all you're getting from me. Which brings us to our last entry on the list. <laughs> The Ross and Shuriken. Thrilling stuff, I'm aware. But the Ross and Shuriken is an S rank for all the reasons that the Ross and Shuriken tailed Beast Ball is an S rank. The Ross and Shuriken requires Naruto to not only have mastered the Rasengan, an A rank jutsu, but also apply an elemental release to said Rasengan, something that both Kakashi and Minato could not do. And then, after Naruto applies that elemental release to this Rasengan, something that two of the most talented people in the entirety of his universe could not do, he then had to apply shape transformation to the elemental release that that he applied to that Rasengan. And the shape transformation he applied to said Rasengan made it so sharp that it cut on a molecular level, which allowed for things like his lava release Rasen Shuriken to be able to cut the god tree in half. But also, more importantly than anything, by applying wind release and shape transformation to his Rasengan, he was now able to throw his Rasengan. For the sheer fact that Naruto did something that both Minato and Kakashi couldn't do and then improved on that, yeah, that's pretty obviously gonna be an s rank jutsu. And with that, that's every single manga canon s rank jutsu. In fact, that's every single manga canon and anime canon s rank jutsu because there's no anime canon s rank jutsus. I think I did it in under 35 minutes, so Cody can't yell at me. But I'm curious to hear from you guys. Out of all of the s rank jutsus on this list, which is your favorite? And is there a jutsu out there in the Naruto world that you believe deserves the s ranked moniker but never got it? Tell me in the comments below. And to why you guys are down there, please for me. Like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. It's the Dragon Boat Festival today, which means me and Dorothy are going to 99 Ranch.